uh, and I welcome you to uh, Cork Astronomy Club's uh, lockdown lecture. Who am I, you may ask? My name is Peter, uh, and I'm chair of Cork Astronomy Club, and I extend a warm welcome to every one of you who's joining us in this meeting. Normally, this lecture would be held at a, in a lecture theatre at UCC, but of course, these are not normal times. That's why we do it on Zoom. It's nicely on to our speaker tonight, who's Kevin Nolan. Now, Kevin will not be discussing the uh, uh, looking at Mars in the sky. Kevin is going to be talking about the exploration of Mars. Um, uh, Kevin uh, is actually the author of a book, uh, a Mars, a Cosmic Stepping Stone, um, uh, which he published in uh, 2009. He lectures in physics at the Technical University of Dublin. Um, I've actually been hoping to get Kevin to come and talk to us in Cork Astronomy Club for many years now. And one of the benefits, one of the few benefits of this lockdown arrangement and having meetings by Zoom is that we can actually get Kevin because he's sitting in Dublin and uh, uh, he's now going to be talking to us, uh, which is something I've been hoping to achieve for six or seven years at least. So Kevin, you're very welcome. And we now look forward to what you have to say about Mars, a cosmic stepping stone. Kevin Nolan. Thanks, Peter. Can you hear me? I can. Great. I'm going to try and share screen now. Are you, can you all see that? We can. Brilliant. Great stuff. Well, thanks a million for inviting me to give this talk, Peter. As I said, um, many years trying to organize this. The issue, of course, is I've, I've always got physics labs on Tuesday mornings at nine. And I don't drive, so getting down to Cork for Mondays has been a problem. But this is a surprise uh, um, reason, or I suppose advantage of the video conferencing. Um, so before I just start, I'll just say that uh, you know, you know, I've had a long, many connections with Cork. Uh, in fact, I'm a part-time PhD student uh, in astrophysics through Dr. Niall Smith, who's my oldest and best friend. We've known each other since 1979. We used to run the Clondalkin Astronomical Club together, and I still see Niall all the time. And um, in fact, this talk and the book itself, as you said, it flagged the book, you know, um, that happened, originated in Cork, because as Steve said, in, two, in August 28, 2003, in fact, Mars was at its close approach for 58,000 years. And so I gave a talk for BCO there, there, and then I came home the next day and a friend of mine said to me, you should write a book about Mars. Oh, well, it's too late now. So I actually just sent in a submission to Springer just as a complete unknown, and they came back to me the next day and said, let's do it, because they had discovered nobody had written a book about Mars in at least 10 years. So there was a gap in the market, so they chose an unknown person like me. And um, anyway, seven years later, I thought I could write, but they taught me I, I couldn't write, and um, took seven years to research, and uh, many Mars scientists had a hand in it. So, um, it, you know, it was a great experience. Um, and I suppose, as I say, is the reason why this talk can happen today, because that talk all those years ago in Cork, now, this is a, normally a one-hour talk. Peter's asked to do it in 30 to 40 minutes. So I will be talking fast, and there's a lot of visual images in this. It's a long, it's a big story we're trying to just cover here, and I will be skipping through a lot of images. Um, <clears throat> so it's very visual. There's a few slides with writing on them I'll read through. But as I said, um, you know, I, rather than just kind of hack the, the talk together, I just thought if we haven't got time, like there's, uh, there's movies in four or five of the slides, we won't run those just to try and get through the main, the main point of this story. So as um, Peter and Steve said, this is not so much about the observing of Mars from an earthly perspective, although we'll mention that in, in passing, it is about what is going on in relation to uh, the uh, um, exploration of Mars that's been continuing since 1965, uh, but actually has, has um, enjoyed a renaissance since 1996. And we're still in that phased program right now. So look, general slide of the Milky Way galaxy, and of course, one of the biggest issues associated with um, science is the question of life in the universe, and more in particular, the origin of life on Earth. In fact, there are, there are two questions, they're, they're the same question asked from two different perspectives. We feel if we gain an understanding on the origin of life on Earth, we will also have gathered an understanding of its cosmic abundance and vice versa. If we get to understand the cosmic nature of life, it will explain its origins here on Earth. We're making great strides forward. This is an image of 1 16th of the Milky Way galaxy, imaged by the Switzer Infrared Space Telescope. 
it's 50,000 images uh, accumulated together and everything that's green in that is organic um, uh, carbon uh, molecules strewn across interstellar space. We now know that 80% of the organic materials or the carbon-based materials in space are organic and they're strewn everywhere. So we're, 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 we're of course, um, trying to get a, a handle from a cosmological perspective on you know, the nature of life, on the nature of planets, and whether or not we are alone or not, or whether life is a, a common and abundant phenomenon, or whether we are a unique phenomenon within, say, for example, our Milky Way galaxy. And of course, we've made great strides forward, particularly with vast ground-based telescopes like ESO here on the left, the European Southern Observatory, which Ireland has just joined, and the uh, Space Telescope as well, Hubble and Switzer there. And we've made um, enormous discoveries. We've discovered literally solar systems forming inside the Orion Nebula. This, this region of the Orion Nebula has um, 90 times all of Earth's oceans of water forming every single day. And um, we're discovering solar systems at an extraordinary rate through telescopes like Kepler, which has discovered like um, planets like Gliese uh, 581, mm -hmm. the Trappist system, and even our next door neighbor, Proxima Centauri, or, or, or um, yeah, Proxima Centauri has um, one, possibly two planets associated with it, and indeed an Earth uh, like planet, in as much as it's a rocky planet in what we believe is the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. Um, so we're making great strides forward, but you know, this is a perhaps um, as great a challenge in science as understanding the nature of the universe itself and understanding the nature of dark matter and dark energy, we're barely beginning this search. And um, there's a gr you know, gr great prospects for the future with the European Southern Observatory building the 40 meter uh, reflector, first light supposed to happen around 2025, 26, the James Webb Space Telescope, first light 2023. And even when it comes to our own solar system, um, well, we're going to talk about Mars shortly, we, we now, of course, have uh, you know, uh, a real interest in one of the moons of Jupiter called Europa and one of the moons of Saturn called Enceladus, which we suspect may have temperate oceans underneath their icy surfaces within which you know, the um, um, complex molecules of organic molecules of life may even reside, in which case the question as to whether there's life there arises too. So you can see that from this whistle-stop tour that you know, from, from every perspective we can consider, we're asking questions about life in the universe. Now, um, while that's well and good, um, and it's, it's, well, that's the wrong thing saying as if, as if somehow there's a problem with that. Um, this is well and good and it's wonderful and we will continue to do it. There's another way of approaching the question of life in the universe and that is actually to consider its origin. Now, the talk, um, this talk, we could spend our whole talk on just this one image. And it's going to be hard in this uh, speedy, speedy talk to try and convey what I want to convey here, which is about a year's research, say, around my book and, you know, has, has um, filled the supplementary pages of Scientific American, you know, special releases, which is the question of the origin of life and, and the relationship in particular of Earth as a planet to life. In other words, its planetary context. And um, if you consider Earth, well, you realize it's got extraordinary dynamism and forces in its interior uh, through, you know, um, the convective movement in, 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 in uh, the mantle and also the heat emanating from the core. It's got then that expression on the surface through volcanic and plate tectonic activity. And there are enormous energies coming down from above from the sun's light to cosmic rays and solar radiation, gravitational influences from the moon, the sun, the other planets. So when you look at the Earth, you realize that this skin that we see on the planet, the biosphere, is kind of this balance, this expression of the balancing of forces and energies that are coming from beneath the planet and also raining down from above. And in Earth, that's construed to give this extraordinary dynamism and this extraordinary balance, whereby the system is this beautiful paradise we now know and upon which life basically predominates and in fact governs very much at this stage how the planet itself plays out into the future. Now that occurs of course because the planet is active and active in particular ways, in particular tectonic and volcanic, volcanic activity are crucial to why our planet is a living planet, but also through what we call the volatile materials and volatile systems that occur. The volatile materials meaning simple molecules that um, 
you know, basically change state from solid to liquid to gas on earth, water, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia in particular. And in particular on earth, two of those, the carbon cycle and the hydrological cycle, as they change from solid to liquid to gas um, over days, weeks, months, years, and millennia are what gives rise to Earth's um, extraordinary capability of balancing these powers and these energies. Now, the thing is, is that what we're re increasingly realizing is, is that in that cycling of the volatile materials right from the very beginning, we would always have friction points, you know, uh, fresh water flowing into salty water, giving alkali um, acid boundaries. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the thawing of water giving, uh, uh, giving raise to precipitation and, and, um, and, and, and temperature changes. Um, the laying of salts on the ground, giving rise to electron potential for energies in the, in the system. So what we have begun to understand since the 70s and 80s is that the dynamism and the balance of all these capabilities um, is what gave rise to interesting phenomenon that might have led towards the complexity of life. And when, then when we start to ask those questions about what are they, we're talking about, and we all know this, we need the synthesis of organic molecules from simple to complex ones. We need natural energy sources um, from the environment uh, for life uh, so that we can give rise to the functions of life such as replication, metabolism, sensory perception, and even evolution. And what Earth seems to have done, at least from the out outset of the very beginning, is provided this environment for this to flourish. Now, whether life came from somewhere else as a cellular phenomenon or whether life originated on Earth is still an open question. It's probably that, well, not probably, I think most would wager that it originated here. But irrespective, the, the, the story of life on Earth from the very beginning has been the symbiotic relationship between the dynamism of the planet through its internal movements and structures and movements and the external forces coming down with, and these hydrological and volatile cycles giving rise to the conditions within which something we would call life could emerge and as a stark reminder that we say the earth like planets and habitable zones we see the moon there at the same position as the earth in the solar system but lifeless from the beginning uh, indicating that very much it's not just whether you're an Earth-like planet in a habitable zone, but all of these extraordinary things going on that would give rise to something as complex as life. And so the question of the origin of life becomes a series of questions about, and I won't read all this, but basically uh, just of organic synthesis, of natural energy sources, of capabilities to polymerize or link simple organic molecules into longer ones so they can store the information for replication, for the creation of what we call metastable environments for this to be nurtured and for membranes to occur, for cells to arise and so forth and all of that. And they are the questions that have occupied us since the 70s regarding the origin of life. Now, in all of that, if you even consider just, for example, planets like uh, Jupiter, I mean, the difference between Earth and Jupiter is we look at Jupiter today and it bears no historic record of what it was like four billion years ago. Well, it does. It was probably the same. It, this is the difference between Earth has a story that's embedded in its structure. Uh, Jupiter doesn't. We can't go back and look at precise phenomenon or moments in Jupiter's history. We can tell about its general characteristics from it. And even likewise, as interesting as Europa and Enceladus are, again, their structure and, and, and evolution and morphology and dynamics are very much uh, governed by these planets and actually don't really retain a, an ancient record of what they were like billions of years ago. And that's what brings us onto Mars, because just a stepping stone away from us, literally, and that's where the name for the book came from, just a few months away on a, you know, an, an unmanned space probe, we encounter a planet that we've, we discover for about its first billion years was characterized by all of the things I just said. It was clement environment. It had plate tectonic movement, as we'll see when we look at um, the, uh, uh, some of the discoveries we've made. And it was characterized by water, um, to, you know, the, the, uh, vast amounts of water, enough to fill the globe to a depth of 500 meters in its early situation. Tectonic movement, volcanic activity, 
and indeed, as we've discovered, as we'll see, hydrothermal activity and a range of other phenomena. So I very often hear people saying, why are we going to Mars? Or even some people saying, I'm tired of Mars. Let's go to Venus. Let's go to Enceladus. The fact is, is that when you look at these crucial dynamics as to what gave rise to life on Earth, there isn't a, 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 you know, a closer analogue that we know of in the universe to study. And one extraordinarily crucial difference between Mars and Earth is, for reasons that we're beginning to understand, Mars cooled down and shut down about three and a half billion years ago. So it incredibly retains a global record of its early activity in ways that even the Earth doesn't retain because the Earth has rejuvenated its entire system multiple times over from the lithosphere from the surface up over the billions of years. So there's barely any evidence of Earth from, I beg your pardon, even say seven or 800 million years ago, let alone three or four billion years ago. So not only does Mars represent an, another attempt at what was going on on Earth, but it retains the record on a global level right there and now. Now, before we just step in to take a look at some of the discoveries we've made from the different probes, it's worth highlighting that, and this could be another talk on its own, we've had a long relationship with Mars. And as Steve pointed out, one of the reasons why Mars is closer and more distant uh, at different times is because you can see there in the upper uh, left-hand corner, its orbit is the most elliptical of all the planets in the solar system. So it's less circular than Earth. And sometimes we happen to be close to it when it's, near, when it's in opposition. Sometimes it's further away. And Johannes Kepler was able to use that particular shape of Mars orbit to discover it orbits the sun, not the Earth, and hence the, uh, give rise to our modern view of our universe, of a solar system at least, with the sun at the center. So from the beginning, Mars has been important to us. And in fact, I, you know, I very often say it's always been one step ahead of us. It's tantalized us for centuries. Johannes, um, sorry, um, Christian Huygens saw Sirtis Major here, this major phenomenon, which we're landing at with Perseverance next uh, February. The Perseverance rover, um, just about here. And um, he was able to determine that it has a 24 hour day, 23, uh, what's a five degree axial tilt. So it has a day like Earth, it has polar ice caps, it has four seasons, each of them lasting six months instead of two, uh, three months, but it seemed to have very Earth-like qualities. And as telescopes got better through to the 19th century, astronomers such as uh, Schiaparelli here and Percival o, Now, Schiaparelli was a draftsman and he saw many lineations, which he called canals, but Percival Lowell claimed them to be canals. So by the turn of the century, about half of the world of astronomy subscribed to the notion that there were canals on Mars and half didn't. And this was a great debating point really from around 1870 through to 1916 when Percival Lowell died. So much so that actually at the turn of the century, Mars was quite a taboo subject to study because nobody wanted to go near it because of this controversy over the canals, which carried itself up through into the 1960s, believe it or not. So at the time, from 1900 to about 1950, there were about a thousand professional astronomers in the USA at the time, which was leading astronomy at the time. Now, astrophysics was being born, so people were distracted by the expanding universe and Einstein's theory of rel relativity and quantum theory and all the rest of it. Nobody of the 1,000 astronomers, nobody other than maybe uh, Jared Kuiper was studying Mars, so it was just basically left alone. But of course, with the discovery of quantum theory and um, you know, our understanding of the Earth and plate tectonics, a number of questions started to arise in the 60s. This man here is, on the left is Joshua Ledberg, who he proposed that there was a relationship between biochemistry and microbiology and posed the question as to whether there might be a planetary context for life on Venus, Mars, and the Earth. With Carl Sagan, who very much drove the efforts, while he's popular and people kind of often accredit him with doing more than he did, he really did lead, bring these people together and lead the drive for planetary exploration in the 60s. He convened the first meetings about Mars exploration. And indeed, he was in a meeting on Mars exploration with um, uh, what's his name? I've forgotten his first name, Calvin, um, who discovered the photos. Uh, in fact, um, Calvin was notified that he'd won the Nobel Prize for photosynthesis uh, uh, during a meeting on Mars exploration, literally sitting on a panel when somebody came up and whispered in his ear that he'd won the Nobel Prize. And we have Francis Drake, who's been you know, a proponent of life in the universe. And here's James Webb, by the way, the James Webb Space Telescope. He was the administrator of NASA in the 60s who basically saved planetary science when Lyndon B. Johnson was going to close it down. So we had these people in the 1960s who proposed that, you know, 
there might be a planetary context for life and hey guess what we can go there we can build space probes and we can examine the planet so this has of course happened um, and we sent two probes mariner uh, four mariner six and seven six uh, failed en route in 1965 and 1967 or 68 actually forgotten but what they discovered devastatingly was a planet with craters all over it and so it looked like the moon and in fact that's why lyndon b johnson wanted to shut down the mars program because basically it just looked like there'd never be life there it looks like the moon and uh, once you see craters you realize there's been no activity for hundreds of millions of years so mars just looked dead but in fact um james webb said to lyndon b johnson that jpl had invested 30,000 human years of experience by then that must have been you know several thousand engineers over a decade and in fact he so convinced lyndon b johnson of the value of unmanned planned exploration that lyndon b johnson increased the budget to give rise to mariner 9 the viking the voyagers and pioneers and so forth and this is why james webb has been honored by this telescope he really was a pivotal nasa administrator in the late 60s now again mars tantalizes us and toys with it and plays with it because when we landed on mars in the 1960s we discovered in fact that there was not only was there no life there but the surface is a sterilizing agent and basically destroys organic matter there's less organic matter on the surface of mars than there even is on the moon from crashed comets and asteroids and as a result of that nasa did shut down the mars program in 1980 and there's carl sagan with a um, a, a model of um, the Viking lander and Carl Sagan was so incensed by this that he formed the Planetary Society with the then JPL uh, director and head of the Viking mission Bruce Murray uh, to basically enthuse people in Mars exploration because Carl Sagan basically said you if you if you just because you don't find life in one location on Mars doesn't mean you know everything about Mars so he formed the Planetary Society to basically encourage interest in planetary exploration and I've represented the Planetary Society in Ireland for many years as their outreach coordinator. But the Mars, um, NASA did recoil from Mars exploration from 76, the last time thing they funded to 1996. But in the meantime, through the 80s, the Mars orbiters had accumulated um, no less than 58,000 images of the surface. And so um, geologists and planetary scientists got busy and got working analyzing these and they assembled this map. This is similar to the one that Steve posted earlier on. And they built this well this is this is actually from a later probe called mars global surveyor but it conveys the point they what they discovered about mars was what i alluded to earlier on was that it, although we can see craters and we looks very lunar like in the southern hemisphere in the northern hemisphere it's very flat and we can see this vast region here called the tharsis bulge upon which you can see the great olympus mons and other volcanoes and um, and then the valles marinaris at three thousand wide kilometer wide uh, Rift Valley in Mars and uh, Elysium Mons over here and plenty of uh, tectonic activity over here as well. So what and then what they discovered was that Mars had three great eras in its history. The earliest era up until around three and a half billion years ago called the Noatian period um, and re related to the earliest uh, part of Mars here was actually very dynamic. It had plate tectonic movement, volcanoes. It had an atmosphere 1.2 times as dense as the Earth's of carbon dioxide um, and over 10,000 rivers discovered lakes and now we know that there was a great northern ocean on Mars and um, all across the northern lowlands in fact they found that the datum the the sea level you know of Mars is somewhere around the equator and it's five kilometers higher than lower so you can even see when Mars was shutting down in its middle era around three and a half billion years ago called the Hesperian era there was these vast floods. These are vast flood channels that were carved open by floods that occurred. And, and you know, some of these floods had more water flowing in one flood than we say the Mississippi flow uh, puts through in, in 100 years. These were gargantuan floods. We don't know why they occurred, actually, but they happened when Mars was shutting down. And then around 3 billion years ago, Mars ground to a halt and preserved this record of that ancient tectonic activity, volcanic activity, rivers, and um, lakes this was a vast lake lake here and um, oceanic uh, features and so forth and has been slowing down ever since so the thing is is that of course what we discovered was that mars in its early history was very active in ways similar to earth and so by 1995 and i remember reading this document and literally getting a tingle down my spine called an exobiological strategy for mars the 19 top nasa scientists had written this um 
document and basically proposed that the chances of life arising on Mars were about equal to them arising on Earth. And Carl Sagan was part of that, but he died a year later in 1996, actually, um, of a rare blood disease. So he didn't get the seed, the fruits of all his work in the, in the current era of Mars exploration. But essentially put in, in, in uh, the point here that there was a five-phase strategy put in place, orbital analysis of the planet, then land on the surface to analyze the chemistry, the story of water and carbon, and then land on the planet to, to see if there's uh, external or uh, ancient life there, or to search for origins, uh, traces of orange. And that's what Perseverance will do next February. It's the first phase three exobiological lander. And then phase four, a sample return, bring uh, samples back from Mars. That's now to happen between 2028 and 2031, and then possibly humans to Mars eventually. So let me try and give you then as quickly as I can a whistle-stop tour of the extraordinary armada of space probes that have traveled to the planet in the last 24 years and have revolutionized our understanding of this extraordinary world. Well, in 1996, um, uh, the Pathfinder little rover arrived there and discovered indeed that it was in one of those floodplains. That's where it is. And you see floodplain rocks there. So it was a test mission for rover technology, but also verified on the surface ground truth a bigger pardon, that there were floods on Mars in the past. But then very quickly after the main part of phase one orbital analysis occurred, the Mars Global Surveyor in 1997, Mars Odyssey in 2001, the European Mars Express in 2003, 2004, and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2007. Now these three are still in operation and are the three major space probes that have made most of the orbital discoveries. So to give you a whistle up tour of these discoveries for Mars Global Surveyor, well, first of all, everywhere it looked, it found layered um, topology, um, topography. And this is basically indicating that you have dynamism, wind, water, and um, uh, ice uh, um, change. In other words, it's not like the moon. You'd never find layered, layered features on the moon. This is a, an active planet, and it's still active today. It found examples of river deltas, and in fact, the Perseverance rover is going to land in one of these where a river was flowing into an ancient lake. Here's the magnetic mapping to show that there was past tectonic activity four billion years ago. This is called magnetic striation. As the, 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 um, the plates were moving apart and then the internal magnetic dynamo was reversing poles every few million years causing, you know, you've got um, north and south, north and south pole. So we, we saw, see that indeed for Mars's earliest history, there was plate tectonic activity on the surface. Um, and this is an extraordinary map. This is a height map where red is very high and blue is very low. It used an instrument called MOLA where it fired 670 million laser pulses at the surface. So this is a map of Mars's to topography accurate to 100 meter lateral resolution and single meter vertical resolution. And here you can see the northern lowlands, the canal, the, the great flood channels flowing north into it, um, and that the northern highlands are of, of higher in, um, and then this is the great Tharsis bulge, which was the, the, the source of most of the tectonic and volcanic activity in its early history. Um, Odyssey then, which is still operational today, discovered that indeed there's water on Mars today, 60 degrees of north and south in each latitude, within just a meter of the surface is pure water ice, enough to melt that if you melted it, you'd cover the globe to 50 meters today and discovered salt materials and these co false color images were mapping the, um, the, the geochemistry, the mineralogy of the planet. And the mineralogy is the key to understanding the actual past activity on the planet. This is one of its latest images showing where astronauts should go. Literally, they say it on the NASA website, astronauts can go here with a bucket and a spade, dig about centimeters under the ground, and they will get pure water. And if future astronauts will go to Mars, it would cost $100,000 per kilogram or per liter of water and they don't need to bring it now. The European Mars Express, of course, imaged the planet in 3D, gave us whole new perspectives on, on water runoff, and but most famously, of course, um, discovered the underwater lakes, one in 1918 under the North Poles, and then four more lakes just announced last week. These are lakes that are there now under the ice in the pole regions. There's very salty, briny water, but nevertheless, liquid water on the surface of Mars underneath its polar ice caps. Uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is this extraordinary mission from NASA, it's got you know, vast amounts of RAM on board, and um, you know, is really the, it, it can image an object half a meter wide on the surface in stereo. 
and has extraordinary mapping and um, a mineralogical mapping. And of course, like with Mars Express, does this thing called radio sounding where it can analyze underneath the surface. And that's what Mars Express did to discover the actual underwater lakes. And here it's just showing you how it does this. It scans under the surface and there you see the actual um, layers of ice. And then what Express has found is on the base of the actual polar ice caps, that's where the lakes are. I'll move on. Uh, but Mars Express also, or sorry, a bigger than Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has discovered an ancient sea that was um, eight times the volume of the Great Lakes, 800 kilometers wide, and extraordinarily had vast amounts of hydrothermal activity. And hydrothermal activity is where we think life's first opportunity came. So this is one of the hotspots on Mars to visit in the future to see did life actually arise there. And I took these extraordinary images of a, of a crater called Jezero Crater with, it, with its um, um, <clears throat> river delta. And this is where we're sending Mars Perseverance. It'll land just around here, around uh, February the 18th next year. And these are clay materials. And we're going to see ardor evidence of ancient microbial life within that river delta. This is about the size of Dublin Bay here. So we'll see better images of this later on. And here is one of the latest images. There's, um, this is a scar at around Ireland's latitude, but 50 degrees north in the Northern Hemisphere. That's about 80 meters there. And there, these are layers of water ice, just meters under the surface. If you wanted verification, the water's there. There you go, it's right there. Now we've sent a number of rovers as well. So we sent uh, in 2003, because Mars was so close, Spirit and Opportunity. And Spirit landed in a crater called Gale Crater to see was it a lake and sure enough just scratch away the red surface and there are salts pure salt indicating it was a salty lake uh, hole in one nailed it in one and um, opportunity was sent to the far side of the plant to a place called Meridini Planum to see was it an ancient sea and sure enough it landed in a crater and discovered um, salt materials right there where it landed and just outside that little crater, you can actually see the salt deposits all across the surface. In fact, this region was inundated as a sea multiple times over in Mars history. Now, Opportunity then spent uh, between 2007, it arrived at this crater called Victoria Crater in 2007 and was imaged, there's an image from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of it coming up to see this crater. And it analyzed that crater, but then spent um, from 2007 to 2011, four years trekking over 20 kilometers across the surface to this vast crater called Endeavour Crater, 22 kilometer wide crater, and drove across a sea of sand basically, and arrived in 2011. And sure enough from orbit, we could see this clay materials there. And opportunity, it drove 40 kilometers in total, and was just about to endeavor on its greatest science mission to examine those clay materials. We think clay materials are important to the origin of life, when suddenly a dust storm came and put it out of action. But here, just to show you the symbiotic relation between analyzing the, the rover's uh, terrain from orbit and then the rover then plotting its own uh, trajectory forward. It was an artificially intelligent rover and then it was just about to drive down into the actual Endeavour crater. This is a near infrared image when suddenly then Mars was hit by a global dust storm. This is in 2017 or 2018, no 2017 into 2018 and this shows from orbit. There's where opportunity was and it got completely covered in dust and, and stopped operations. It was operating for success for 14 years, but it was still going strong until it was put out of action by a dust storm. Now, uh, in, 20, 000, in 2008, we sent a probe near the poles and called Phoenix, and it landed and it took this extraordinary image. It scraped away the dust, and there is pure water ice, verifying what I said earlier on. The ice is there. There's vast reservoirs of water. A third of Mars's surface is water ice within a meter under the surface. We wouldn't have just known that even years ago. So just to summarize then what we discovered by around 2012, we had found indeed that Mars was clement in its past. It had tens of thousands of lakes, rivers, great ocean, tectonic activity. But the question still persists on a whole range of issues. How long was the water there? How hot was the planet? In, how salty was the water? How, what sort of energy capabilities are there to deliver for uh, first, maybe you know, prebiotic chemistry, the sorts of energy we need to get life going. So, although we've got a good general understanding of the planet, all of the specifics, in other words, think of it this way we've got to start asking questions from millions of years resolution down to thousands of year resolution and down to the molecular level. 
So that's why we felt by 2012 we're not done. And of course, NASA then sent the next rover, Mars Curiosity, to a crater called Gale Crater um, here, which we knew was an ancient lake in the past as well. It straddles the northern and southern hemisphere. So it was a great location to examine. And we sent it into this. This is called Mount Sharp into this. You can see an alluvial fan from a river flowing into the actual um, uh, uh, it, it, this is an infrared image from the opposite direction. There's the, 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 the river flowing into the, the crater. There's the alluvial fan. And we wanted to examine, okay, water flowing there. Could it be any evidence of the kinds of things that might be suitable to life's first chances? This is a beautiful video. I wish I had time to show you, but I don't, of you know, an animation of the probe landing. But Mars uh, reconnaissance orbit and orbiter witnessed it come in to land. And indeed, it, it, found, it landed right in that alluvial plain. There's an image from the surface looking at the river, back up towards the river that was flowing into the crater. And then um, you can see there's the impact region from, from orbit as to where it landed. Now, since 2012, uh, Curiosity has been analyzing uh, Mars, this crater, and the, its discoveries have been nothing short of quite extraordinary. To put this in perspective, this is the route it was taking up into these mountains. And you can see the layering there, five kilometers thick of layering. Um, and every layer is a different era in Mars's history to analyze. So it's been traveling through that for the last eight years. And I'm going to move quickly through these. There's the, again the probe from orbit. And um, it, for example, it, I start, as soon as it started to drive, it started to discover that indeed it was in a riverbed. It found uh, um, you, you know, uh, sandstones, mudstones, uh, and bro broken bedpan. I'll just move forward here. Uh, like, look at every layer is um, you know, from precipitation, there was rain in the area, and every layer here is a layer of precipitation and a layer of uh, um, um, flow from you know, uh, materials being carried along in the river, being laid down as sedimentary layers. These are on the centimeter level, these layers here. So just overwhelming, here's broken uh, uh, river bedpan. So everywhere in the region was inundated with water. And then it used its very sophisticated instruments to do an extraordinary analysis. and discovered organic molecules inside mudstones. In fact, it found even there that 2% of the actual soil is made of water. And so, and it found seasonal variations in methane, which is very interesting because very few, few, there are a few sources of methane uh, on a planet and one of them is microbial life, but we can't claim we've discovered microbial life yet. But by 2018, basically we had declared that this region of Mars was habitable. Doesn't mean it was inhabited, but it means it was capable of um, um, housing life as we know it, microbial life as we know it. And um, we know that the lake that was there was fresh water, neutral pH, low salinity. We found complex organic molecules inside the mudstones. And not only that, we found that along the actual basin of the actual lake itself, that it's what's called differentiated from an oxidation standpoint, meaning just like lakes on Earth that there are different regions that different kinds of microbes would be able to harness. In other words, this lake wasn't a static pool of water. It was differentiated in terms of its potential energy sources to microbes in the same way lakes are. And we've even found some of the actual materials laid down on the surface are similar to uh, materials that we find only microbial life lays down on Earth lakes. But we can't claim that yet because we haven't seen microbial life. Now, in fact, to put this in context, Curiosity wasn't sent to find life. It was sent to understand the habitability of the region. So we're still not there in terms of whether or not we can say there's life there because Curiosity wasn't designed to look for life. That's what Perseverance will do when it arrives in February. And Curiosity is continuing up Mount Sharp, a five kilometer um, uh, mountain. And here's a view into the terrain it's going to be pursuing in the current months and years. Uh, and you know, hopefully it'll get some way up Mount Sharp and every time it goes up a different layer, it's actually going to a younger period in Mars's history and hopefully just give, ever, give us ever increasing insights into what the planet was like and its habitability. Now, again, mindful of time, I better move on. Um, of course, we've sent other orbiters there like MAVEN by America. Um, and MAVEN has indeed answered the question that Mars's atmosphere is leaking away into space because of solar radiation. And what we now know is that when Mars's uh, magnetic field shut down three billion years ago, uh, it, it exposed Mars to its uh, water and atmosphere leaking away to space because solar radiation comes in, 
And if you take an oxygen molecule as two oxygens, O2, the solar radiation splits that into two oxygen atoms, and those atoms have enough escape velocity to, to get away from the planet. And here we can see the escape of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen from Mars today. These are maps of the materials leaking into space. So Mars has an atmosphere 1% the strength of the atmosphere of Earth. But it used to be as dense as Earth's atmosphere billions of years ago. Now, we then sent one more probe in 2018 called InSight, not a rover, a lander, to, because all the discussions we're talking about, we don't know anything about the inside of Mars. So InSight, one of the, the great questions about Mars is why did its magnetic field die? And we don't, one of the reasons is the planet cooled down, so the convective flows stopped. But another reason might be that the planet is still warm inside, but it's just frustrated because it's got a very thick outer layers. And so InSight is there to try and determine that question. And InSight landed on Mars in 2018 in near Elysium Mons, uh, which is the other um, tectonic region on the, on the, on the right-hand side of the map I showed you. And this is just one of the most beautiful instruments ever made. Its seismometer can measure vibrations less than the width of a neutron. So even when the tiny moon Phobos moves over, by, over, it causes movement of Mars of about five centimeters, and it can detect it. And it can use that motion to actually um, then probe inside the planet tectonically. And it's then got another extraordinary instrument um, called H3, a little probe that's going to burrow into Mars and then measure the temperature to determine whether there's a hot core inside. Now, this only goes meters under the surface, but they've had terrible trouble with this because it's turned out that the soil of Mars has no friction, so it can't get hold and burrow down. It's driving the instruments, instrumentalists associated with this mission insane. They've been 18 months trying to get the bloody thing to actually burrow down, and every time they, it gets a hold, it slips and comes back and falls away. But the third um, uh, experiment is really beautiful. What they're going to, um, I've got to take the time to tell you this one. Basically, Mars, as you know, has polar ice caps. So it's got two caps, water, ice on each end, but then carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere but cools as a, um, a plate on the northern hemisphere when it's winter there and the southern hemisphere when it's winter there. Now, this carbon dioxide that cools is 15% of the atmosphere, 40 trillion tons. Now, as it moves from one pole to the other, it causes Mars to wobble slightly. And we're going to measure that wobble over two years and by, the, by Mars's resistance to wobble, in other words, its inertia, we'll be able to determine the internal structure of the planet. Is that a beautifully designed experiment or what? So all InSight is doing is transmitting a radio signal twice a day back to Earth, and we're measuring its position to an accuracy of 10 centimeters as to where it is on the planet. That's 10 million times the precision of GPS. And we're going to monitor the wobbling of Mars and its resistance to that wobble and from that, calculate its internal planetary structure. So uh, Peter is probably going mad with me taking too long here. So I'll try and move forward to the latest probe that's to come. This is actually inside on the surface. Um, and there's its, um, its size, some, uh, seismometer before I put it down onto the, the surface. Um, there it is there, that orange thing. And in fact, there's a million or 10 million names of people, including mine, etched on a little chip there, um, so our names are on Mars. If there's a probe going to Mars, you can put your name on it, which is a nice thing to do. So what's happening now is, is that we're entering phase three of the actual planetary exploration to search for evidence of traces of not just life, but organic material, pre anything that might give a suggestion of the origins process in ancient hydrothermal vents or ancient clays or ancient rivers or lakes. So in fact, actually, the uh, Mars 2020 rover or Perseverance is very like Curiosity in design and will land in Jezero Crater. And this is kind of an expansion of it. So again, this is about the, I say, about the size of Dublin Bay. Sorry, I'm Dublin, Dublin biased. It's going to land somewhere around here and drive around the foot of this and take samples and put them into very sophisticated instruments to try and see, are there organic molecules that may be biotic in nature? In other words, that something beyond inorganic chemistry gave rise to those organic molecules. I don't have the time to go through the instruments. It's also bringing a small helicopter that will fly ahead of it and probe the area and then report back and tell it where are interesting sites to go to. And then in two years time, Europe is sending a rover, the ExoMars rover, uh, to similarly drill under the ground. And there's an Irishman called Dr. Leo Metcalf, who taught me in UCD, who's the science operations manager for this mission. Uh, so actually there, Peter, uh, somebody to get a talk. 
in the future as well. Again, landing where these great floods were and where we think actually there maybe if life got going on Mars, this could be a location where we think it got going. And then between 2028, I wish I had time to show you the movie, but I don't. So we'll just use this graphic. Uh, this is now arranged between ESA and NASA. In fact, Perseverance, when it lands in February, will collect 40 samples, put them into canisters and drop them like a trail of bread comes along its route. And then in 2028, um, uh, is it NASA? NASA are going to send, an, uh, sorry, ESA are going to send another rover to collect one of those canisters. And then NASA are going to send a lander to, uh, and then the ESA rover is going to bring it to the NASA lander. And the NASA lander is going to launch that into orbit. And then ESA are going to pick it up with an orbiter and bring it back to Earth. Uh, between 2028 and 2021. So that's very exciting because, of course, all of this feeds into the issues of humans to Mars. And uh, again, this could be another entire talk, but as you maybe know, in fact, let's put it this way about humans to Mars. While there's no mission or plan to go to Mars, it, it, there's a political ratification in both Europe and the US and indeed in China to go to Mars. And that wasn't the case until the mid noughties So there's a desire to go there. So the way NASA are doing it is they want to go back to the moon. Uh, they want to learn about long-term habitability in space through the International Space Station. They want to go back to the moon using the space launch system, which they hope to do in 2024. If this looks like science fiction, well, this is an image from two days ago. Here's the rocket, Artemis 1, that they hope to send four people back to the moon in 2024, the first land the first woman on the moon, a man and a woman. Um, and basically, this space launch system is, was de designed, actually, to build human-rated spaceships in low Earth orbit to send people to Mars. And the hope being that when we learn long-term occupation of the moon and the International Space Station studies on longevity in space, and then you've got, of course, SpaceX coming into the actual equation as well. Elon Musk wants to build what he calls a starship. Now, his, his ideas are very ambitious, and he's certainly being disruptive in this field. He wants to push people towards Mars at the soonest uh, possible juncture. I would wager it'll be another 20 years at least before we send people to Mars. But nevertheless, through sample return, uh, through uh, sp space launch system, through SpaceX, and even, indeed through Chinese, Chinese significant efforts as well, all, all paths are leading to one direction. That's to Mars. So to sum up this, I'm, I'm nearly done, Peter. Bear with me. Um, there are remaining questions. What's the precise composition of the planet? What was the precise surface uh, process? Was it a clement planet or was it always chilly and cold and everything happening under ice? Um, you know, what, what um, electrochemical and you know, acidic alkali um, activity actually occurred on Mars? What mineralogical energy sources were there? What prebiotic chemistry actually happened? And in other words, then, did micro microbial life ever evolve? Because Getting from bare rock to a microbe is, is, is a harder leap than from microbes to us. You know, this is an extraordinary leap from an animate to the living world. If we find microbial life there, this will be a game changer. It'll be revolutionary. You'll be able to say two, two planets in the solar system gave rise to life. So the search for fossilized evidence of this micro microbial life is also on the cards for perseverance and into the future. Now, um, the thing is, is that as I say, it, well, this, what this slide just says, and I'll just say it is, it's a search for origins as much as it's a search for life. And I hope when I talk about Earth and the dynamism there, and you see that was like that on Mars in these early years, that this is a, a search worthwhile doing. But just the, two last slides to sum up some, I suppose, you know, philosophical thoughts to finish the talk. So what is at stake in this search is humanity's place in the cosmos. I mean, are we alone or is there life elsewhere? Um, it's a search for origins that happened on Earth, but using Mars to explore it. Um, it will have profound implications for life. You know, if we know there's more life out there, how will that affect us as a civilization in the long run? And here's a question for you. Let's say there, was, there is living biology there today, and let's say SpaceX land there and then declare it's a um, trade secret. They're gonna, the genetic structure is their information, their data to use as they please, and you're not getting a look in. How do you feel about that? So the technological implications, in other words, what people say is, if we find a second take on biology, it will revolutionize biology, potentially revolutionize medicine. But of course, um, you know, if a private company owns it, then there's the whole ethical issues associated with that. So in terms of Mars, what I'll sum by saying is, while many say, you know, we've got to send people there, actually 
we're there. Look at the work we're doing. It's mind blowing. Um, so it's part of our future. We're, we're going one way and that's to Mars. Whether we land people there in 10, 20 or 50 years, I'm for sustainability. Uh, I want to do it slower and right. I want to do the science right. And if there's life there, I want that ethical discussion across all of society before we go and just then um, colonize it for our own purposes. Let's do that bit right. But some questions to pose to you if you want to get involved in this, because after all, this is not about Elon Musk or NASA. It's about us all, our own future. You know, how much money do you want to go into this? Billions or trillions to send people there? Are you, um, how do you feel about Ireland being involved in this? I mean, how do you feel about the robotics versus human exploration debate? Um, should we be going to Mars or should we be spending money in other locations? Um, what about the contamination issues? Contaminating Mars or bringing micro microbial life back here? And the question of whether space exploration is a societal benefit or whether it's for commercial use. All of these are going to be debated. They're all going to be explored in coming years. And the, you know, um, they're, they're unanswered questions. And the question is, do you want particular stakeholders to pursue this or do you want to have a stake and claim in this? So if you think you want to be interested, follow ESA, follow NASA, follow the International Space uh, University, connect with BCO, connect with the Cork Astronomical Club, um, you'll get online, join groups and find out about it. Maybe talk to your politicians as well. Is Ireland funding ESA enough or too much? Well, as the case may be. So, um, as I said, um, that's, that's the talk. Um, I, I hope I've revealed that like, it's an interesting subject. The consequences from a scientific and uh, human endeavor standpoint are enormous. But as I just alluded to the end, the discussions on a kind of a philosophical and societal and political and economic basis are hopefully just as interesting thank you um right so uh who's gonna steve has a question i, I suppose the one overarching question of query a thought i have on the whole mars thing is the reason mars is like it is today is its core shut down it lost its magnetic field the sun blasted its atmosphere away so if we're talking about going back to Mars, we're going to be living in bubbles on, on the surface, I, I'm, I'm guessing. Like, I mean, there, there is no hope of ever, whether it's ethical or not, I don't know, but there is no hope, I think, of ever terraforming it unless our technology goes, you know, a thousand years from now or 10,000 years from now or something. Just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as I said, I follow I, the Mars Society online and mm -hmm. SpaceX actually online and like it's filled with people passionate to go colonize the planet. I'm not one of them. Yeah. Um, and, but they do use a lot of false arguments and you, you've highlighted one there, which is even earth at its very worst is a paradise by comparison to Mars. Right. Yeah. Now, of course, the point is, is that we're, you know, we've been interested in space exploration for a scientific standpoint to do with origins. There really is reason to go there to explore. Think mm -hmm. like for every one of those rovers I mentioned each, each day they pass possibly 50 interesting sites to go to one so what a human could do in an afternoon on mars would be equal to years of robotic work so as an exploration standpoint to go there there's all sorts of reasons but in fact even i'll say by the way researching it you know the way when you kind of think about something a lot you get a, a different understanding of it we'd have to send um five people there for nine nine hundred days and as a, at a minimum and they'd be re reaching the planet at 15 times the speed of a bullet and if they miss it, they, there's no chance ever of saving them. It is so, em so oh. imagine them leaving Earth and not seeing even the Earth globe. It's so empty. It's, it's, it'll take extraordinary feats of bravery to basically go there, even to explore it for a few days. So when people can't talk about exploring it or colonizing it, I think by orders of magnitude, they're underestimating the scale of what's going on. And then I'll finish up by saying what you're saying is, yeah, it's diabolically hostile on the surface. So it will require extraordinary technologies brought ahead of them, including mini nuclear reactors to basically, you know, and vast amounts of um, um, supplies to get people to survive just for the 400 days or something that stay on the surface, you know? Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. So I see a question here. Um, has anyone ever figured out how big a planet has to be to hold onto its atmosphere in a Mars-like place. Well, you see, the thing about Mars is, is that we don't know the answer as to why its core shut down. 
we used to think it was because it's small, it's a tenth the mass of the Earth, so it cooled down. But recent thinking is, is that it still might be warm under there, that it was just frustrated by an extra thick lid. The thing, if you think about a kettle with the, con the convection of the water flowing up and down it, that's only because there's, there's actually um, a gap in the lid to mm. allow for actually heat to be emitted. If you actually seal the kettle, you'd cause problems and you'd shut the convection down. So mm. Mars may actually have heat under the surface. And if it was just a thinner uh, crust, then maybe you'd still have convective flows. Then you'd have your magnetic dynamo. It would have a magnetic field and still have an atmosphere. So to get back to your terraforming, maybe in a million years, they'll drill big boreholes on the surface, get the convection flowing, and there you go. got a magnetic field again. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, the size of the planet isn't necessarily the thing. Mars was big enough to generate an excellent magnetic field in its early history. So the next question is from, um, that, sorry, that question was from Ted, uh, what's a Haubach? And then I've got one here from uh, so McCuddy. So question, if evidence of life on Mars is found, does the debate move uh, to how special in our solar, uh, how special is our solar system? Or does it right away move to, to life is abundant? Oh, that's a beautiful question. I don't, I, and I don't want to hog this, by the way, if others want to chime in on this, say, I'll just say this, and I, this is not my idea, I've heard this. We're an example of one. If we find that life originated on Mars, in other words, that it independently originated on two of eight planets in our solar system, that has got to suggest that it could be abundant elsewhere as well. doesn't guarantee it, but it certainly nods in that direction. So the discovery of life on Mars that we could verify would be independent because Mars and Earth exchange material. So we might find life there and discover it's the same genetic material as Earth. Half a ton of Mars lands on Earth every year. So that if, Mar if life originated from Mars, it, it could be here, if you know what I mean. So the point is, is that we can't know until we find that life and look at it genetically, the imp full implications. But I think no matter what that discovery would be, even a fossilized microbes, I think will be global news. And I do think will affect society. Remember when President um, Clinton announced the possible fossilization in Iraq that was then used in the film Contact. Um, so the thing is, is that it was big news. It took the president of the United States to say, I'm making that announcement. So I think any suggestions of life on Mars will be a big deal in my view. I wish we could have a two way chat on this. I don't know if anybody else wants, Peter, do you want to chime in or Steve? Can you remind us, Kevin, that that, that, that announcement by President Clinton, that was a false announcement, wasn't it? Well, it's not actually that you can say it was a false announcement. Basically, they found from a meteorite, on um, there's a place in Antarctica called Allen Hills that gathers meteorites through uh, the motion of glaciers and wind erosion. And we were able to determine that this meteorite came from Mars from 3.7 billion years ago, was blasted off Mars 13 million years ago, and landed on Earth X number of thousand years ago. When we analyzed it, we found what looked like to be fossilized evidence of microbial life, and indeed the same um, residue of, of metabolism that microbes on Earth have. Now, the debate is still very much open on this, um, but it, and there were fracture lines in the rock across the supposed fossilized bacteria to indicate that if it, was, if it is a fossilized bacteria, it came from where the rock came from, i.e. Mars. And we know the rock came from Mars because little air pockets in the actual rock itself were identical to Mars's atmosphere. So we knew it was a Martian rock. Um, and, but the thing is, is that others have come up with uh, alternative explanations to all of the evidence. So it's still an open debate. I tend, to, I'm, I'm usually skeptical of these things. I tend to think it is microbial fossilization. I really do. If you read about all of the evidence, it certainly squares up. I think we're right to be skeptical because in science, there's a thing where you say, you know, a, a single measurement never constitutes a proper science measurement. So we'd have to find more, but it's, it's certainly an open question still. But for a few months, it really did look like, yes, this is evidence of microbial life on Mars in its past. And it was big enough announcement for President Clinton to make the announcement himself. So we've got Podrick here. I had a question above uh, related to the debate in mention. That's an interesting debate. If we're on a course to destroy all of uh, our uh, lost life, on this planet, what gives us the right to go to do the same on another planet? Uh, part of Musk's uh, terraforming plan involves nuking, yeah, the, uh, um, it to create greenhouse. So Elon Musk's plans propose taking Earth's nuclear warheads, bringing them to Mars, and detonating them over both poles, 
to melt all the water, to have it flow across the surface. Now, you know, this is his plan. The, the, the problem with Elon Musk is this is, there's a lot of good in what he's doing. You know, he's a very disruptive character, battery technology and so forth. But it was ideas on Mars are a crackpot. And in my view, very, very worrying. And I think um, what Podrick says is right. I mean, Carl Sagan said it himself, if we find life there, we really need to ask the question, should we go there? And it's not because of just whether microbial life is important or not, but here's the point. We're basically casting our die, the die, as to how we regard life on other planets. Because who gives us the right to say we'll wipe that microbial life out? What if we go to Proxima Centauri and we find, you know, small marsupials and other type of life there? Do we then decide we can wipe it out? Where do you draw that line? So my argument is, and I think myself and Porik would agree on this, is that you've got to open this up to society, uh, to have a societal debate on if there's life on Mars, whether we should send people there. The problem is, and I used to be a bit more naive and argue this and say, we've got to have this great debate in the future of society, about whether we send people to Mars or not. Have those debates ever occurred in the past about human activity anywhere we went on Earth? No, they didn't. The people with money basically went and, and did what they want. And that's kind of what's happening again. It's the Elon Musks and the uh, Bezos of this world who are deciding they're shaping what the next space exploration will be. And there's a lot of good in that, but you know, possibly some ethical questions as well. As in, we could all debate these things forever. I'm just reading these questions here. So we've got from Column: does a manned expedition to Mars increase the chances of microbial contamination in comparison to unmanned microbe or probes? Well, Yes, in as much as, you know, we sterilize our space probes over there as they go there, but they're still not contaminant free of microbes. Actually, it's virtually impossible to do that. So if we go there and have a long term presence, we are basically going to cause greater contamination. It's just going to happen. But indeed, actually, there's a debate at the moment whether we should declare certain places on Mars special regions that humans can't go to because they may be there may be possible life there now. So that debate still has to be opened. But actually, the US has been driven very much by commercial activity, and they want to shut that debate down. That's kind of where there was a big, Niall Smith and BCO did a European Space Agency survey in Cork about three years ago. So you might take a place in it. And it was done across 22 countries. And Europe is actually a little bit more left leaning, as we know anyway. But the, the general consensus among European civilians was, let's be cautious about going. Let's do our space exploration. Let's do it for the goodness of all, for non-commercial reasons. And um, you know, basically do this in a kind of a, a sustainable way. But actually, that th those, those statistical answers didn't go down very well with the he head honchos in ESA. Um, so they're, they're kind of wanting to do things a little bit more kind of fast than that, a little bit faster than that. Um, so we got one here from Ronan Newman. Hi, Ronan. Um, question, was the data returned from the Viking 976 inconclusive in relation to the chance of microbial life in the soil? I think Ronan, you know the answer to that. And of course, that's a huge debate. One of the missions in Mars suggested there might be life there. Uh, one of the, um, I beg your pardon, Viking uh, probes suggested there might be life there. Um, but, uh, and indeed the designer of the experiment to this day claims it's evidence that there was microbial life there, but there are alternative answers. But I think we know that's, a, that's a separate discussion, that one is. So that's it, Peter. That's the questions um, that I can see for the moment. You, Kevin, you must be exhausted with what you've been talking to us. If, if you, if you'd like to stay on for the informal session, we'll be oh, hang on. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, hang on for a few minutes, no problem. And I think now I just want to um, formally thank you, Kevin, for your enormously um, uh, enthusiastic and even passionate uh, presentation. Uh, you were at great pains to uh, try to restrict yourself to time, as I asked you to do. But, and then, of course, uh, several people came on saying, oh, well, Kevin should have been allowed to speak longer because we could listen to him all night. <laughs> and in fact, I, I certainly could have done as well. If you'd actually been down at UCC, Kevin, I would have been handing you a nice bottle of wine. So I'm sorry you've missed out on that, Kevin. And to oh, everyone else, I would also say that at this stage, oh. if you were at UCC, I'd be inviting you down to the front of the lecture theatre to offer you tea. I can do none of these things. This, this well, is the disadvantage of Zoom. But the advantage a, of Zoom is that we actually hear from Kevin. Yeah, it was a pleasure, Peter, and an honour to, to talk. Thanks so much. Beautiful questions. And um, sorry for going over time, but another time I'll be down. I'll do my damnedest to come down maybe in future years. 
and we'll all meet up in person then. So thanks so much for inviting yeah. me. We, we can call that the kind of end of the formal session. So thank you very much, and not only to Kevin, but to all of you. Does anyone want to ask Kevin a question or say, or it doesn't have to be a question to Kevin, it can just be an observation on any topic. I can't pass a book without buying it. So I'm wondering where, like, do I buy your book, Kevin, on Amazon or do you have a better Oh yeah, Kevin, Kevin, hold your book up. I, I, yes. I told Kevin at the beginning he should show he hold his book up, yeah. but he was too shy. But hold it up. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it, it is available on Amazon and um, yeah, you can get it as a Kindle as well. Um, what I will say is that Peter said it was written in 2009. So um, now the whole basis and motivation for going there is about two thirds of the book. So that's still very much up to date. Um, and then all the evidence and, and discoveries up to curiosity are there. Curiosities aren't because it was before it. Um, and actually a really strange happenstance for the later third of the book, because I wrote what I projected was the timeline of people going to Mars, at least the projected timelines. And that meant very much out of date in the last several years. But actually, amazingly, because uh, there was complaints about Trump earlier on, with the whole Trump thing, it's come right back into their mapped out timeline. So this curious thing is that the projected thoughts about how we might go to Mars have suddenly uh, you know, mapped now to NASA's kind of plans, you know? So the latter third of the book, which I thought would be the most out of date, have kind of come right back into date. So in fact, it won't happen. But what they want to say they want to do is try and send people by 2033, because Steve, as you said, in fact, 2035 will be the closest approach, but 2033 is also very favorable. And this space launch system used to be called, I call it air rays in the book. And when Obama came along, he canceled air rays, but they just renamed it space launch system. It looks the same. It is the same rocket. And sure enough, because the Trump is such an ambitious git, he, he was the one who's basically trying to get people to the moon. So if he re-wins his election, he can say, I sent people back to the moon. And that's where that impetus is coming from. So NASA are plowing ahead with the people to the moon using SLS and then the sample return mission. Like that's been the holy grail for science is to get samples back. And again, that's been on and off and on and off. And again, in my own book, I've, I've even saying that will be sometime in the late 20s. And sure enough, it's happening. So it's quite extraordinary that, um, that what we're seeing happen with Mars and the moon over the next 10 or 15 years is being pushed in that direction. Strangely enough, Biden and Obama were not good for space exploration. Um, they kind of put it on the back burner a bit. So if Biden gets into power, maybe all of this will be pushed onto the back burner again. You know, my book will become instantly out of date again, you know. Another quick one there. Sorry again for hogging it. But um, I ju just a name popped into my head and I'm just wondering in all your research on, on Mars, have you ever come across or had any dealings with somebody called Robert Zubrin? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, I follow Robert Zubrin on Facebook and I, I, I lambaste him about twice a week. I've, I've just seen him in a few documentaries. He, he's an American scientist yeah. who's a, a massive advocate for traveling to Mars. Yeah. He well, just he, comes across as being fanatical. Oh, he is totally fanatical. Robert Zubrin was the person who basically wrote NASA's first what's called design reference mission, which is their mm -hmm. it's a multi thousand page document on, on how right. to get to Mars. But he fell out with them. NASA at the time were looking at costs of $100 billion plus. He claimed you could do it for 30 billion or less. And he wrote a book called The Case for Mars. And it, a bit like Elon Musk, he turned out to be right. He, he actually, he mocked away an awful lot of the cobwebs in NASA to say you can do it quicker. But the thing is, is that um, he is totally against any sort of, forward or backward contamination, planetary protection. He kind of thinks even if there's life there, there's no risk of bringing it back. And he, he kind of thinks if there's life there, who cares? Just go. So, and he, he's absolutely, in fact, his book, The Case for Mars, is what inspired Elon Musk to basically dedicate his life to going to Mars. I mean, don't, don't underestimate Elon Musk's equally fanatical commitment to going there. That's his raison d'etre for life. So the thing is, is that's why he sold PayPal and uh, you know, everything else is to get to Mars. So what I will say is, is that Robert Zubrin is a very divisive character and he, he is endlessly criticizing NASA's efforts and he couldn't care less about uh, robotic exploration of the planet. And he posts on this regularly. Um, and uh, as I say, definitely, well, I'm not saying he knows who the hell I am, but I just have to send rebuttals the whole time. It drives me absolutely insane. But 
he, he, is, he gets funding from NASA. And again, a bit like Elon Musk, he's a disruptive character in as much as he pushes things to get done. And, and, and that's good. That can be good, you know? But Kevin, is he one of these people, Zubrin and, and Musk, I don't know, uh, are, are they amongst the cohort who see Mars as a kind of lifeboat for humanity? We should set up an alternative society there. I mean, is that what is? Is it that which motivates him? Yeah. Well, certainly for Elon Musk, he seems to like what seems to drive him. Uh, again, I don't know any more than you don't know about him. Was he? What he is? He is passionate about the future. Like it's kind of curious that he, they like SpaceX have no ethical statement about Mars or life on Mars, but he's concerned about AI and its impact on humans. So his whole central purpose seems to be uh, to save humanity. You know, to be one of the people who drives humanity forward so he keeps arguing that to save people from an asteroid hitting earth and wiping all life out we need people on a second planet and you know what that's in uh, kind of a you know a secondary school essay level a reasonable argument the problem is is that like here's the thing you know this lsst that's come along this synoptic telescope eight meter telescope is going to survey the sky every three days within 10 years we're going to know of every near earth object down to 100 meters so the sort of threat he's talking about will probably have mapped, you know, I'm, I'm not saying solved, but within decades. So the sort of threat he's talking about is so unlikely that spending trillions of dollars to get a community of people over on Mars um, just doesn't sound like a very good argument. I mean, build a city under the ocean. It'd be one hundredth the cost, you know? I mean, <laughs> so many other ways yeah. to do this better, you know? <laughs> but, but, but that said... We want to push out. We are exploratory by nature. It's such a cliche, but it's actually true. So the whole purpose of exploration, you can't really argue against that, you know? Could I chime in with something there? Because I, I read the case for Mars years ago, and I used to be mad into this argument. He, he made me a fanatic as well, but now I'm kind of... Uh, now I'm kind of, we'll say, ambivalent about going to Mars. There's good reasons and there's bad reasons. But uh, <clears throat> Zubrin was very into this. He still is into this idea called frontierism. It was like, it was, it was brilliant. Humans were better when they were going through America, taming the wilderness. And so he believes there's no wilderness left. So he says, we got to send, it's, it's part uh, in case an asteroid strikes the Earth, humanity will be safe. That's yeah. part of it. But it's also this idea that, we got to tame the wilderness because when humans are taming the wilderness, that's at their best. But I I think, I suppose I kind of agree with the point, but I think the wilderness could be anything. Like, I think the wilderness could be the human body. The human body could be break down because it could get cancer or strokes or whatever. So yeah. let's tame that wilderness and make the human body yeah. less likely to get sick or music or science or whatever you want could be the wilderness. So I kind of agree with this argument up to a point, but there's no particular reason necessarily to go to Mars and I mean you could I mean you could argue you could argue the wilderness as anything like I think that's an excellent point and, and actually surveys show that less than 20% of the general population agree with human space flight of any kind and I'm at pains to argue this even with the planetary society because I keep saying to them, and this is something for the Corecast and society as well I keep saying to the planetary society we shouldn't be promoting space just because it's enthusiastic and we love it because most people don't, but yeah. there's other reasons to be interested in space. Um, and and you you mentioned those there in as much as you know for the the purpose, the value of it for satellite communications. So the, I think your point is brilliantly made. Is that yeah, you know, just because some small niche cohort want to go there doesn't mean most people will or ever agree with it. And as you say, there's so many other domains of wilderness from the psychological to the human body to everything else. Yeah, brilliant point. So <laughs> this taming the wilderness sounds a bit like manifest destiny to me. I don't like the sound of it at all. Well, I will make a point in Zubrin's defence. Uh, he said that when uh, he said that when humans or people went to America, they enslaved the Native Americans. But there's nobody on Mars to enslave or hurt. But then you get the whole issue: what if there is life there, and what if humans start? hurting that life or destroying it or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, and again, uh, uh, the point I was making there about that one is is that like, like there are already, you know, a thing called breakthrough starshot. There's already proposals to build tiny little space probes to send them to actually the Alpha Centauri system at 20% the speed of light. 
that they get there in 20 years, we're already beginning to think about leaving our star system in meaningful ways. I mean, if we're going to go to Mars and ask the question as to what do we do on a planet if there's life there already? I think that is a question worth asking. And what worries me, you know, there's loads about what Zubrin and, and Elon Musk are about that I, I agree with, but I just really worry about well, on two fronts. One, environmental sustainability. Let's not make all the same mistakes again on those places we made on Earth. And two, this question, the ethical question of if there's life there, how do we behave? Because as I say, it's what well, if we could do it, if we could send people there in the next 20, 30 years, as I say, we are setting in stone what we what, what future society does. And I think yeah. that's a big question. So I don't fully agree with Musk there because just because it's microbial life doesn't mean it has no value. And this is, let, let me put it this way. Let's say we discover eventually that there was life on only two worlds in the in Milky Way galaxy, the Earth and Mars. That's it. And Mars had microbial life and we wiped it out. You know, what's the value of it then? You know, it's all so relative. And to just be say that it's only microbial, let's go. You know, I mean, what in the Mars society, they kind of, the argument they very often use, and this comes from a market economics, right, right, you know, very, extreme right way of thinking. Very often people in the space in um, Mars society on Facebook, and I've joined them to debate them, to hear the arguments. They kind of say, we've wiped out far higher levels of life on earth and that's our right. So who cares about microbes on Mars? It's horrible. It's yeah, that's, that's that, horrendous. That's a prevalent argument in the USA today. A prevalent argument across the wide spectrum yeah. of the space community. Like I would like, I'd agree if it's a choice. I'd kind of agree if it's a choice between them and us. Like, if the if the human race is going to go extinct, and the only way is to wipe out uh, microbes, then I'd agree. But it, it has to be that severe because, like. I think destroying the microbes on Mars would be like it'd be worse than destroying the Library of Alexandria, like may, maybe a million times worse. I don't know, but a lot worse anyway. <clears throat> well, the, the other side of it is the presumption. I mean, the, going there with the presumption that I mean, who knows what this planet has to tell us about its history? It's got four billion years of activity. Like we talk about microbial life as if it's nothing. Well. We're in lockdown across a planet because of microbial life. Yeah, yeah. It's the presumption that I don't like. It's just way too arrogant, way too, you know, slipshot, you know. Kevin, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you all the way. I, can I just um, change the subject to what you might call a slightly more prosaic question, but something which um, I'm trying to get straight in my head. It's this question about how Mars lost its atmosphere. And I, I'm, I'm trying to disentangle two factors. There's the factor that Mars is very small and had therefore has a, a weak uh, gravitational field. And then there's the question about the early shutdown of the magnetic field. And I'm, I'm trying to work out which of those the, the, does the magnetic field have some uh, role in retaining an atmosphere? Because I, I always thought it was only the gravitational field. No, and um, overwhelmingly, it's the magnetic field is the issue. Um, even on Mars, if you had molecular oxygen, like, if, for example, when water uh, evaporates, for, or well, sublimes actually from the surface, uh, from its stockpiles, from solid to gas, as a molecule, uh, as a vapor, it can't escape. But when solar radiation, ultraviolet rays from the sun uh, hit the molecule, they break it to two oxygen, uh, <laughs> two hydrogens and, a water and an oxygen. Um, and each of those atoms can escape. But the reason why, of course, they became atomized was because there's no mag magnetic field to deflect um, um, the, the, um, the, uh, the, Solar, solar, yeah, solar particles. Now, in fact, actually, I've, I've conflated two issues there. I didn't explain it. I didn't explain it in the right order. I said ultraviolet. That's got nothing to do with magnetic field. Um, the uh, magnetic field deflects, uh, you know, protons and electrons and all sorts of other particles that would cause the atomization um, and break down those those molecules. And then once they're single atoms. Uh, they, they would even escape Earth, actually, Earth's gravity, not even Mars's gravity, which is only a third as strong. Um, the, the ultraviolet thing actually is just 
it's worse. It makes it worse. But the, the real issue is the actual particle cosmic radiation that or, and solar radiation that comes in and impacts on the atoms or the molecules, breaks them into their in constituent atoms, and then they just have enough escape velocity to escape the planet. So if Mars was the size it was now with a magnetic field, it would have an atmosphere. Right. Now I get it. I never got it before, but I get yeah. it now. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, in relation to ultraviolet, of course, the area ozone layer protects. It does also causes the breakdown you know, of material. So if we had no ozone layer, then ultraviolet light would be an issue for breaking down molecular oxygen and nitrogen into their atomized. So even ultraviolet light will contribute. But, but it was actually the particle radiation from the sun and cosmic radiation, by the way, which is severe, um, uh, that actually does the damage. And this MAVEN space probe, is, it's, and in fact, Europe has another orbiter in there called the TRACE, um, the, 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 the Atmospheric Trace Orbiter, which is actually measuring the leakage. It's actually detecting the particles they flow by. It's kind of got a detector that literally is open to it and measuring the flow of these particles as they come off the atmosphere right now. So Mars's atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, but it's only 1% of what it used to be. Now, does anyone else want to say anything? It doesn't have to be couched in the form of a question to Kevin. I was just going to say um, thanks for the talk, Kevin. It was brilliant. Really enjoyed it. And um, I'm just a guest. I'm in the process of joining up as a member. Um, but first, I wanted to say that, like, on microbial life, I suppose that's where Earth came, Earth's life came from. So treat microbial life on Mars different makes is nonsensical. And then the other thing I was going to say is, like, Earth is set up perfectly for life on the surface, and, you know, with our atmosphere and our distance and our materials. Do you think Mars could be set up perfectly for subterranean life, you know, like at a microbial level, just with the fact that, as you mentioned, you've got that sterility barrier on the surface, you've got movements internally. It's just a case of it's a different type of perfect for different type of life. It, there, there's no doubt there's a temperature gradient, there's liquid water under, and you know, all sorts of hydrothermal activity going on underneath the surface. There could be flourishing ecosystems of microbial life there now. And let, let's put it this way, there's no habit or environment on Mars other than the surface um, peroxide agents uh, that is more hostile than the most hostile places on Earth where we find life. So there's plenty of opportunity. If life emerged in the beginning, there's plenty of opportunity for it to have hung on. Now, let's be clear, Mars was never Earth. You know, it would be at most microbial life. But that, that's the question, that's the debate, then, as to how with, we with, with Perseverance landing in, in early next year, how long will it take before, you know, the results of its experiments start to filter back? Will it be, you know, three months, six months? Or does it take a while, I think, for the probes usually to boot up and... Yeah. So this will get working within days and it will start gathering samples within weeks. No doubt about it. Um, but, you know, it's not, again, go, we're not thinking it's going to find my, living microbial life. In fact, what is Ever, yeah. we can identify the difference between organic molecules that were created, um, you know, biotically because of isotopic ratio differences than in our um, in, in organic uh, or, um, or sorry, yeah, non-biological ways of creating organic material. So, its success would be finding, you know, any sort of what we might call prebiotic activity that might have given rise to life. If we find that, it'd be exciting. And you know, all, all I'll say is that's a huge leap. I mean, everything we've discovered today has been just extraordinarily exciting. Like water everywhere, that it was habitable in the past, that there was an atmosphere, rivers flowing, lakes with organic molecules being synthesized in them. You know, we're not done with this planet yet. That's the thing. It's very exciting, you know. I think probably the time is approaching when we should all go home. Well, I mean, I know we are all home, but <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, we've been going for nearly two hours now. Is there anyone else who has a burning desire to say something? Kevin, can I ask a question to Kevin? Meeting in question on Mars, um, you know, the, 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 the set of the, the trace orbiter to, to look at it and to find out, you know, where it is. But, you know, it's only, it's a huge question. It's, is it all over the whole planet or is it a certain area only or... Um, it's in certain locations, and they are locations where they're more interesting parts of Mars. So it's been detected in certain locations by the Mars Express Orbiter, by the Mars Trace um, oh, the, the, the Trace Atmosphere Observer uh, Orbiter, 
and also actually by the Mars Curiosity rover in its location. So, um, and what's extraordinary is it's seasonal. It arises at certain seasons of the year. Now, methane can't exist in the atmosphere for more than 300 years. So it's being made now or released now. So there's something active on the planet. Now, there's three hypotheses. The only things that can produce methane are, it arrives from comets and we know that's not happening. So that's not it. Microbial activity, uh, waste product is methane or um, some hydrothermal activity. If you have in a carbon dioxide atmosphere, water flowing over igneous rock, um, hot water in a hot hydrothermal environment, it'll synthesize methane. Now, even the worst case scenario is great because that means there's hydrothermal activity there. Mm -hmm. uh, even better would be it might be underground microbial life. Actually, what's really being favored is it might actually be traps of methane, just like hydro, hyd you know, hydrocarbon uh, materials on Earth from billions of years ago. So it might be stockpiles of this from the past that get released when certain climatized changes occur on the planet. So we might be actually monitoring historical creations of it in the past, but they would have to be fairly recent creations. So for example, we do know that there's been tectonic and volcanic activity in the last few million years, for example, it's not a dead planet, but it is one of the great mysteries. Of course, it would be amazing if it turned out to be coming from microbial life, but nobody wants to say that or call that, but we don't know yet, Ronan, but it is being released or created now. In fact, one of the, the things I wanted to show you was just created by Maven Rover. It was a, it was a film, Go, check Maven Ultraviolet um, Glowing. Uh, so basically the planet is actually glowing ultraviolet aurora. They're as bright as aurora on Earth, just in ultraviolet. And um, it's, it's, it's by ultraviolet light in the sun, causing um, materials in the atmosphere to break down and remix. So the, here, there you go. It's actually breaking the carbon dioxide down to carbon and oxygen and water down to hydrogen and oxygen and recombining them uh, to form uh, acids, in fact. And then they circulate on wind patterns. So they're using this ultraviolet glow to trace the wind patterns of Mars. And it's turning out that they're huge and dynamic from 40 kilometers up down to the ground and over day and night and over seasons, this, this whole wind activity. So you're right, Ron, it's a very active place still. Yeah. Yeah. I, think the time, I think the time has come to say that I've enjoyed all your company. Kevin, once more, thanks ever so much. Pleasure, well, thank you. It's been a well, pleasure meeting you all. Uh, let's meet in face, face to face one day. Thank you. Really, really great for yes, exactly. a fascinating speaker. So yeah. I will wish you all, one and all, a very good night.